Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 5 on Heredity. This is video number 28 and we're going to be looking at DNA sequencing and profiling. In this video what we're going to be doing is investigating very briefly some uses of technology to determine inheritance, inheritance patterns in a population, for example using DNA sequencing and profiling. Now DNA sequencing and profiling are two very big processes uh, and in order not to try and make this video too long, and I know a lot of them already are, uh, I will skip through a few things and we'll look at some of these in a little bit more detail during class time. So what we want you to be able to do is to describe the technique of DNA sequencing, that's very important, uh, to contrast different methods of sequencing and profiling which is kind of a second level. And then if you can get to a point where you feel comfortable discussing the importance of techniques like PCR in DNA sequencing and profiling, then you're starting to understand some of the uh, underlying reasons, not only for the processes themselves, but of the technologies that are associated with supporting these processes. So let's have a look at these in just a little bit of detail. So firstly, DNA sequencing. So DNA sequencing is the process of determining the sequence of nucleotide bases in a piece of DNA. So where we have, we know that our DNA is, is double-stranded. We know that when we're looking at copying the DNA, we know that there's a template side, um, and that template side is the side that gets read when we are doing protein synthesis. So when we've got messenger RNA coming through and building up uh, the messenger RNA that's going to take that information through to the ribosome and to the transfer RNAs. Now we need to know what that code is um, and for certain sections of the DNA of course we can talk about the human genome that is the whole sequence of bases on all of the chromosomes but usually when we're talking about DNA sequencing we're just talking about a small piece of DNA from one chromosome for example maybe just containing a single gene and we still want to be able to map that sequence of nucleotide bases. And that's really what sequencing is all about. This is relatively recent, 50, 60 odd years uh, old. We'd been able to um, understand the structure of, obviously the structure of DNA came in the early 50s uh, with the work of Watson, Crick, Franklin and Wilkins. And since then, we've continued to refine what we know about DNA and uh, we've also continued to develop technologies that have helped to support not just our growing knowledge of DNA, but also how to manipulate um, and um, change some aspects of the DNA code. So we now have a lot of equipment that allows us to do this in a really relatively straightforward kind of a way. And the advantage of this, certainly the advantage in population genetics, is that if you have an identical, unless you have an identical twin, you will have unique uh, genetic code. That is, the sequence of bases in your DNA are going to be unique um, and they're only going to be identical to any other person if you have an identical twin. So that means if we do understand or if we can sequence all of this DNA, we may be able to find sections that are quite useful for us, as we talked about previously in our single nucleotide polymorphisms. So how do we do it? Well, one of the ways that we do it is using this tech technique known as Sanger sequencing. So this was developed by Fred Sanger's group, and they were studying the way in which um, the polymer is built uh, from the pr five prime to the three prime position, looking at the fact that the five prime position has the phosphate end and the three prime position has the sugar end. Uh, so that's a hydroxyl group, which is an OH group, hydroxyl like hydroxide, but uh, no charge. And uh, realized that if they used something that could mimic um, what was going on here, um, then they could actually create a terminal end. So something that would actually stop the polymer from continuing to grow. Now, if they were able to put some sort of a marker on there as well, then they would know exactly where the stop was. And that's, of course, one of the critical things is uh, not just to be able to stop this process of polymerization, but to stop it at a particular place, a place that you want to, to, to know exactly what's going on there. And what they developed were these dideoxynucleotides. 
And so the structure of those is basically to um, create what, what I guess is a, a poisoned end, if you like, a, a terminal end that is going to block further polymerization. So once it reaches this point, it won't go any further. What they used was four of these uh, DDNs. So uh, one for G, one for C, one for T, and one for A. And basically in um, oversimplistic terms, uh, each time one of these uh, that was specific for adenine, for example, uh, one of these dideoxynucleotides that was specific for adenine hit that adenine, it would then stop so that the, the polymerization process would stop at that point. Now, obviously, there's multiple A's, multiple T's, multiple C's, multiple G's. And so there's going to be different lengths of DNA that are going to be produced as a result. If we know what we're looking at, we know what we're targeting, we can kind of get a bit of sense of how long each of these pieces will be, and we can start to actually map the um, sequence of bases all the way through. And so what happens then, and we'll, I'll very quickly look at um, the process of gel electrophoresis, but effectively what we're trying to do is once we've cut um, this DNA, we've, we've added something that we know is gonna cut it, we can then put it through a gel. We can see all of these pieces. And what you see is if you look at the fact that the um, sample that we've got in front of you is reading G, then C, and then T, and then A, as we go up um, this particular gel, then you can see from the technique that our first base is a C, and then our next one is a G, and then our next one is an A. And you can see as we go through this sequence how beautifully we get to map the entire DNA sequence. So uh, we can go through and look at C, G, A, T, G, T, G, C, G, and so on. It's a fantastic technique that was developed. Um, and it's a little more complex than what I've just suggested, but effectively what they were trying to do is just stop at a point where they knew where the stop points were. You have to um, be able to identify these afterwards, otherwise they're just all pieces. Um, so fluorescent markers were often used that sometimes linked in with, uh, say, x-rays to make these um, pieces of DNA stand out wherever they had um, risen to uh, along this gel. So we probably do need to look at the whole process of gel electrophoresis in a little more detail too. Before we do that, there's one very important process that, um, that I guess we need to be aware of. And that is if we're going to analyze uh, DNA, if we want a sequence of DNA, we need a reasonable amount of DNA to work with. So we're, we're uh, looking at amounts and certainly if we're going to apply our DNA sequencing and profiling to specific applications, whether they're forensic, whether they're paternity, we need to have a reasonable amount. And often, um, particularly in a crime scene, the amount of material left behind may not produce sufficient volume of DNA um, for adequate analysis. So how do we get more? Um, how do we amplify the amount of uh, DNA that we have. Well, we do that with PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. So the polymerase chain reaction is a really important reaction and it allows us uh, very simply to increase the amount of DNA that we have. And it does that through three key processes. The first process is a, denat uh, is a denaturing process. Now we've talked about this term in relation to proteins. If you heat them up, you can heat them beyond a certain temperature where the protein starts to break down. It won't function properly, it denatures. Now that happens with the DNA strand as well. If you heat it up to 95 degrees, then you, you basically split the bonds between the bases and, and separate the two strands. Now, one of the problems with this process is that it requires enzymes. Now, that's gonna be kind of one of your default go-tos. Any biological process pretty much doesn't work without enzymes. But if enzymes are involved, then there's other considerations. For example, uh, enzymes do have uh, ideal or optimum conditions of temperature and pH, for example. And usually, high temperatures are not good for enzymes. So we had to look at specific 
um, enzymes that were able to withstand those high temperatures. Otherwise, we've got to denature the DNA first, then we've got to cool it, then we've got to add the enzymes. It gets a little bit messy. If we could put the enzyme in uh, to the one mix, then do the heating, then cool it back and have this process occurring, that would be so much better. And enzymes have been found in extremophiles, in thermophiles that grow in very hot springs. So therefore, their enzymes work at very high temperatures. And these ones are uh, the ones that were used um, to help with this particular process. Following the denaturing process is an annealing process. So what we need to do is we need to um, have a forward and a reverse process. So whether we're reading from the five prime or the three prime direction, we need to have these markers uh, these primers that are going to kick in and um, make sure that we know for the piece of DNA that we're interested in where we're going to start and where we're going to end. So we just want that section of DNA to be copied and we want it to be copied and copied and copied. So the first thing we need to do is we need to have these forward and reverse primers, these, these sections that are going to um, bind to the separated strands of the DNA and to polymerize, uh, polymerize along the chain until we get that length of DNA that we're interested, specifically interested in. So once the polymerase is working, then what we want to do is we want then just to repeat that process over and over. So once we've, we've separated this, we, we're able to uh, create some more DNA. We want from that DNA to create more DNA and more DNA. And that's what the amplification and the extension part of that is all about, making as much DNA as we possibly can. So we throw a polymerase chain reaction in there or PCR, just because when we're doing these analyses, often we don't have enough DNA to work with and we want we want to make the sample size bigger. Then what do we do with it? Well, then we're going to run it on a gel. And that's what the DNA profiling is all about. We're going to take those pieces of DNA that we, we collected maybe from our Sanger process, maybe from a variation on our uh, Sanger process, maybe um, we're going to run something that we've put uh, initially through a PCR to, to help build up lots and lots of pieces. And what we want to do is we want to run uh, a gel. So if we're going to try and identify, actually use the bits of DNA to start to profile, uh, this is also called DNA fingerprinting, because as I mentioned at the beginning, we are unique, unless we have identical twins, we are unique in terms of our DNA. And also a lot of the DNA um, contains uh, what, what's referred to as junk DNA. Um, or variable number tandem repeats. So that VNTR is variable number tandem repeats. To simplify it, if it was a sequence like G, 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 C, 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 G, 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 then this sequence would be repeated over and over and over again. It's not coding, so it's not it's not going to mess up any of the proteins. And uh, a lot of what we're doing with the DNA profiling is picking out these little areas where there is uh, some of these 10 repeats, variable in number. There could be 10, there could be 70. Um, and so they will be different lengths. And what we want to do then is extract the DNA, just collect a sample of DNA, hair, blood, whatever, uh, we want to cut the DNA with restriction enzymes, and we'll look at types of restriction enzymes later on, but basically they will cut the DNA at a particular base sequence. Then we want to label them with a probe. We want to put them through a gel, an electrophoresis gel, where the DNA um, attains a charge, so we need to make sure that there's a charge there because the gel is basically in an electric field, so we want the... Um, the DNA to move, to be attracted to the positive terminal. And the bigger that it is, the slower that it moves. So smaller particles will move more quickly. They'll go uh, further through the gel and larger particles won't go as far. And what that does is it give us, gives us those classic um, barcodes that we saw for that one uh, for that example, when we were looking at uh, Sanger sequencing. How do we use this? Well, there's a number of different ways that we can use DNA profiling. Paternity test is an, and uh, inheritance 
ancestry. These are all very important uses of um, DNA profiling. I mentioned two forensic applications where there's traces uh, of DNA that have been left behind. They can be amplified using PCR and then used to uh, match against uh, samples taken from suspects. We're also using these sorts of techniques in uh, conservation management and also in the incidence of diseases. But we'll have a look at a few of these in a little bit more detail in upcoming videos. Thanks very much for watching.